from the Department of Communication in Phillipsburg. This is a special edition of Inside Government with Cedric Peterson. To our audience here at home and around the world, you are now Inside Government. If you are just tuning in to our series, we are having a conversation on how the government of St. Martin is building um, and fostering resilience crisis management. Um, and we are talking to experts from our partners in Vey and Hay International. And in this edition of the program, I welcome information management expert at Vey and Hay International, Mr. Kenny Meisters. Kenny, it's great to have you as a first time guest in the program. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. As St. Martin, as you're aware, you know, it's a very important uh, that we as a country continue to foster uh, resilient um, resiliency when it comes to handling a crisis. Uh, we, after all, we live six months out of the year in the hurricane season. And of course, there's those unforeseen acts of mother nature like earthquakes and tsunamis that we also, as a small island developing state, must be prepared for. I wanna start off um, and getting to know you first, Kenny, Tell us a little bit about yourself, where are you from, a little bit about your edu educational background, and give us some insight into your professional training. All right, happy to share. Um, so my background originally is in business engineering and IT. So I'm actually a computer scientist or engineer by trade. And I used to work for um, you know larger companies, doing consultancy, uh, all those things. And later on, I happened to went back to the university to study again and specialize in information management, which is not just the technology side, but also the people side, because that was fascinating to me, right? We could have computers and systems do almost everything, but then that doesn't translate necessarily into action or uh, profits or efficiency or whatever your goal is. It is more than the systems. So that really became my fascination and the reason for studying information management, where you have the combination of people, organizations, and technology. Um, and it so happens that at the time I was studying this, the earthquake in 2010 in Haiti happened. And one of my professors who was doing research on information management and crisis invited me to join um, to Haiti albeit you know, a few months after the earthquake, more in the reconstruction. And that was a completely new world to me. That was fascinating. You know, There was um, different dynamics, different organizations, different stakes. Uh, and still I could see that technology and information systems could be beneficial there. But again, we would have to think about what does that mean for people? How do we employ these things in before, during and after a crisis? So that, um, that became my fascination and, and, and I continue doing this in research and still do today at the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands. But I also feel it's important that, we, that I'm not just a scientist studying this from books or from interviews, but also get a feel for what it's like and put the knowledge I have into practice. So I'm also a trained responder for the European Civil Protection, for the United Nations, for the Red Cross and a bunch of other uh, national and international organizations. So I also try to get my, um, you know, boots on the ground where I can help. Uh, and that informs my research and my research informs the possibilities. And likewise, uh, in this project in St. Martin. And that, that's a perfect way to segue into uh, my, my question here. Uh, what are the key challenges um, involved in information sharing between government entities um, during crisis management, and, and how can they be addressed? What would your professional take beyond that? Right, there, there's been a couple of trends and developments over the past years. Um, some specific for crisis, some are things we notice in our society. So you could distinguish between two major components, right? One is the crisis component. And as you mentioned in the introduction, we're not only looking at natural or naturally triggered disasters like hurricanes, earthquakes, and so on but man-made conflicts, pandemics, technological disasters. Uh, as our societies become more complex, we get to deal with more and more of these um, unprecedented crises or the effects of these crises are unknown. You know, our society becomes more intricate, interconnected around the globe. So something happening on one side of the world 
could very well affect another part of the world. Um, so that's one, right? Crises have become more um, complex, unpredictable, not only in terms of triggers, but also in consequences. And if you look at the other side, the information part, well, I think we can all relate to that we've increasingly become an information society, right? You wake up with a mobile phone in your hand and you go to bed with a mobile phone in your head, hand almost. Uh, and this also goes in crisis. It means that people can have uh, information, access to information almost any time, any place. Um, and this, this means that we, in a crisis, we can generate more information, not only the government, but also the people themselves on social media, working together in online environments. Um, so all these actors have more information to share, but we also expect more. We want to know the weather forecast. Uh, last time I was in St. Martin, somebody pointed to me to the Windy app. Um, you know, there's a lot of detail. That, the amount of details and the amount of personalized information we come to expect as citizens yeah. and as society is also increasing. Um, Absolutely. So those two elements in complex complexity of crisis and the advancement of our information society have made information management, on the one hand, I would almost say a potential, it could help us, but it's also a challenge to manage that huge potential in an effective way. And especially if you think about that, people become more empowered because of these tools. Exactly. Yeah. So when we're looking at strategies and technologies, and we, we're, you're touching on that a little bit there when it comes to, for example, you made mention of the Windy app. Uh, which is one that I know I have and use on a constant basis. And because that projection of seeing into the future um, gives some insight of the possibilities. And then, of course, I tune into the experts to see what their take is on that. But my question, what strategies or technologies can be implemented um, to improve information sharing um, and collaboration, actually, um, among government entities, government itself, with its partners within a crisis management um, situation? What would you take beyond that? Uh, well, first, I think the point you mentioned here at the end, collaboration is key, right? If we think about large scale crisis situations, we have a tendency to look at the, the government that, that should take care of us. But we should remember that the government is us. They're also people. Um, and I would say this especially goes for St. Marta. Um, so, and it's in a crisis, almost by definition, is what overwhelms the existing resources. So this means that whatever resources we have at our disposal are not enough to deal with the situation, which means that citizens, uh, companies, other actors have to come in and fill that gap. And, and this happens in every crisis uh, where communities, citizens are taking action. Now. The challenge when it comes to information management is that these two should be connected. We want to know what our community is doing, organizing, and what do they need? What is the government doing and organizing and what do they need? Where do they overlap? Where are we, where could we create synergies? Where can we avoid duplication? And where are gaps that we're not addressing? So in that sense, information management and coordination are really closely linked because only if you know what someone is doing where, and what the situation is, can you effectively mobilize your resources? And this also goes to, that's why I like the term you use, collaboration. It's not about just telling people what to do. It is fostering what the community is doing, creating a shared space where we can inform each other, not direct each other by telling this is what you should do, this is where you should go, but by showing people the information. It is... Um, I'm, I'm always thinking about like driving on the road, right? It is not, a navigation system doesn't force you to follow the rules. It gives you advices. Go left, it will take this long. Go right, it will take this long. And you use your own judgment in comparison with that. So it is right. giving you the information so you can make the decisions. And as long as, as we are informing each other, that will help in a crisis. So how can the technologies because I like the way you approach there as, a, as, a, as an information management and crisis management expert, uh, where you look at St. Martin and you realize that our, our primary asset and strength first starts with us as a people, 
but let's look at how technology itself can help us or assist us as a small community um, in a crisis situation to help better management. Right. What would you? Th what would your points of or expert opinion be on that? So I think this this is to me one of the most fascinating aspects of doing this project. Um, part as a practitioner, part as a scientist or researcher, I feel said Marta. Uh, the strength lies in the community and uh, with no disrespect and, uh, and actually a little bit of admiration, St. Marta is, is a relatively small but strong community. I So far in this project, every time I mention a name, somebody knows that person already. So I think, you know, this is what I would, my advice would be for St. Marta. Don't overcomplicate things because it will get in the way of your sense of community. Um, very practically speaking, and I once mentioned this jokingly, but there is a uh, there is some truth to it. I think with a few good WhatsApp groups, you're already well on your way to share information in St. Marta. So in terms of technologies, I could definitely see tools helping you um, for example, at community shelters, and I know these projects are already happening for registration, for tracking things, um, platforms where you could post updates and you could find the latest information. Um, and you could think about social media platforms that could be used for this, because in a crisis, people will go to the things they know. So rarely people will start installing new apps. Um, and you could think about lightweight tools that you could make work that you could configure to work for you. But my, my biggest concern would be that the technology becomes the lead and people become overzealous. And next thing you know, you have, we're entering things into a system because that's our procedure without realizing what we actually hope to gain from putting information in that system. Um, and even in, in my country here in the Netherlands, I can already see this because, you know, our government is so complicated that in a real crisis, there are so many structures that are activating and systems that people lose track of the overview and what is actually working and what is not. And that is my hope for St. Martin, that it could be an example of keeping that lightweight community structure, not not saying that we shouldn't use technology. You know, I can think about things like uh, Power Apps, Excel, Teams. There's a host of tools available that, that could make, that could help people, but uh, that it should be put there with the, with the perspective of facilitating and not um, because we want systems, because they're cool to use, right? Or because we want to be like the US or something else. I, I would... I think St. Martin could be an example for many other countries and islands like yours that say, hey, this is a lean way of doing it. We're, we're, we're surgically implementing technology where it does make sense instead of a big system and big procedures. And, and that brings me also to, yeah, to the point that I think people are, are key in this, in this process. Kenny, we're going to take our first break here and get into the second half of our, our interview. Thank you so much for such a great start on information management and how this uh, feeds into fostering resilient crisis management. St. Martin, stay with us. I'm speaking to information management expert of VNK International, a key partner in helping St. Martin fostering uh, resilient crisis management skills and capabilities. Our conversation continues with Kenny right after the break. Stay with us. The Civil Registry Department brings you a message on requesting a family tree. A family tree shows the link in the relationship between people in several generations of a family. This can be requested at the Civil Registry Department and can be used at the notary for court proceedings. To request a family tree, you must submit the following to the Civil Registry Department. Valid identification, a letter with a short description stating the purpose of your visit, relationship to the family, personal data on the person whom the tree is being requested, personal data of family members, mention up to which generation you are requesting the family tree, 
telephone number, home, or mobile, email address, preferred communication channel, authorization letter if necessary with copy of identification of authorized person, persons whose information were not updated or were not registered in the basic administration will not be included in the family tree. Payment of 80 guilders must be made to process your request. Depending on the length of research, an additional 80 guilders will be charged. Please contact the Civil Registry Department for more information at Swaliga Road No. 1, Phillipsburg, St. Martin, or call us at 1-721-1721. 542-0652 or email us at berkerzaken sxm at stmartingov.org. You can also visit our website at www.stmartingov.org. Civil Registry Back Office Services. This public service announcement was brought to you by the Civil Registry Department. Do you know there is such a thing as teen dating violence? Seriously, there is. When your boyfriend or girlfriend is controlling your every move, trolling you online, checking your social media page, recording you without your permission, or forcing you to do things you don't want to do, this is abuse. If you find yourself in this situation, please talk to someone you can trust your parents, school counselor, or the police. This message has been brought to you by Women's Desk. Hi everyone, if you're just tuning in, I'm having a conversation with information management expert, Mr. Kenny Maesters of Vainkane International. Uh, Vainkane International being a very key partner in helping St. Martin build um, and fostering resilient crisis management capabilities and skills. As you know, we live six months out of the year in the hurricane season, of course. Dealing with man-made disasters also presents a, pos a possibility to our uh, growing and small economy. So we want to make sure that St. Martin is prepared, and that's why we invite you to join us with this conversation. Kenny, we left off talking about the strategies and technologies that we can use and focusing on the fact that St. Martin it, our biggest strength and asset is our people, our community. Um, and if we can effectively use small applications like an effective WhatsApp group chat, uh, this is one of the key things that you mentioned being a, a successful tool, but we have to make sure that we do not become overzealous in the way we execute because everyone wants to be first. Everyone wants to say that they knew in a crisis, but that's not what we need. We want need organization, we need structure, um, and we need a, a methodical approach to deal with a crisis so that everyone can remain safe. Uh, when it comes to net-centric information, uh, I heard this term being used um, when we are talking about um, you know, training and building our resilience um, in a crisis situation. But what is net-centric? And how can net-centric information management be effectively integrated um, into uh, government entities, uh, government organizations, and NGOs, others that we work with when we are faced with a disaster to help us in a crisis. How does that work? Right. So NetCentric is actually um, a, um, a, a framework or a way to think about how you organize your crisis response and especially information sharing between actors. Um, so traditionally, we talk about command and control, where information flows up and decisions flow down. You can think about military or hierarchical organizations. But in a crisis, you will see that different actors pop up. And actually today, more and more, there are government agencies, there are companies or private organizations, there are community initiatives, there are ad hoc things. So there is no hierarchical reporting lines. So NetCentric essentially says, hey, if we would just accept that these entities and actors are autonomous, but we encourage them to share information in a central way where we, we will be informed about what everybody's doing. So we don't have to delegate decision-making authority. Uh, we just enable information sharing and that would allow people to make better decisions. So going back to what we said in the beginning was really allowing people to do the things they want to do, but being aware of what other people are doing. And this is what net-centric information management is. 
a lot of people think it is some tool or a platform. And yes, they can help, but you can do net centric information management on a WhatsApp group or even a whiteboard with post-it notes. So um, that's always the thing I should mention is when we talk about net centric, we always think about platforms and definitely they can help, but it's not, that's one way of implementing it. Kenny, our community is quite familiar with the um, acronym EOC. It comes up constantly whenever we're facing a disaster and the EOC becomes activated. Um, how can the emergency operations center, uh, the back office of that, be defined and operationalized to facilitate efficient information management and coordination during a crisis situation? This is more of an internal question on how we can become better at this. So that's a very good point. So th again, the, the words you're using are very apt, right? It's facilitating. It's not the people who should have all the information. It's the ones who provide the platform and the procedures. So uh, at the moment, we're working with the government to establish an EUC back office information management team where different people would be working together to collate information from ESFs, but also from communities, from private organizations internationally, so that we would, they would manage a hub, a sort of clearinghouse where all that information would come together, but where also people would could access it when they need to. So we're starting with this in the government, but eventually we hope to grow it in such a way that you know all uh, responders, whether it's formal or government or non-government, could uh, find and add information as well. So indeed, the EUC back office is meant to facilitate a place, both physically and virtually, where people could bring information and get information. And to make it very concrete, the, at the moment, we're, we're establishing that environment in Microsoft Teams, um, because that's a tool that a lot of people in the government are already familiar with. So we're expanding that existing network to also function in a crisis response. So hopefully that explains a bit, yeah. Kenny, what are the critical components um, of an effective information sharing framework between the emergency support function groups? Because this is another part of the structure mm -hmm. of our emergency management system um, that must come together and work as effectively as possible, the emergent, the 10 emergency support function groups, what are the critical components of an effective information sharing framework that can be shared between the ESF groups in collaboration with the overall emergency operations center? What would your take be on that? So the, I would say the very first thing, and that goes for basically all information management, is people, right? You need the right people who can work with information, not only in a technical sense, but also gotcha. who, who are able to reach out, you know, who can understand what other people might need. So it is really the first step is having the right people and uh, training these people and encouraging them and giving them the opportunity to grow, right? It takes time to develop those skills. And then the second thing is agreements. Um, so when do we share information? What information do we share? It's about knowing and having this sensitivity of knowing what information you have that might be beneficial to others and vice versa. What information could you generate that you could give to other people? What information they may have? So it is about partially about making working agreements, such as where do we store this information? How often do we update it? Who's maintaining it and those things but it's also this sensitivity of knowing what information I have and what I was going to bring. And what the answer to that is not fixed because it will depend on the crisis. It will evolve over time. So this comes back to the people, you know, we need to update these frameworks and these agreements all the time. And then the last component in the list is technology. You know, once we have those, when, where, and how could we insert technology to help us do our jobs faster, easier, uh, give more overview and encourage other people to join. Which, which takes me into the concept of um, exploring what are the innovative, um, what is the innovative capacity of St. Martin as you see it as an information manager, uh, information expert manager um, within VNK International working with St. Martin, what would that be in your, in your sight, in your vision? 
I think that the there is a lot of capacity for innovation, but innovation is not just technology. It's also about having the ideas. In organizational sciences, there is this idea of what we call dynamic capabilities. It says that you don't have to be the one who's able to do everything. It is you, your key core capability is finding the people who can help you achieve those things. So, you know, it doesn't mean that St. Martha should have all software developers, AI specialists, and all these other things, but you should be aware that they exist, these technologies, assess their value, and then work with partners to uh, see how they can help you. Because it's very hard to say, okay, this is now the next iteration. We're all looking now at AI, for example. Uh, but technologies can be shaped, right? It's also about knowing what your needs are and how um, you know the technology can be shaped to help you. And this is this is more than the tech itself. This is where you become with you know important to do requirements analysis and find the right people that can help you. And I think this potential is definitely there in Sid Marta. Um, you know, especially again with this community uh, and the agility you could have in St. Martin. Kenny, there's so much that we can cover, but we're running out of time. And I want to give you the opportunity as our information management expert at Vanity International, working with St. Martin to provide the community of St. Martin with final words. You have the floor. Thank you uh, for that opportunity. So I would say the, for me, it is inspiring to see what's the community, how the community works in St. Martin. And as I said, I think it is an example for how crisis management should be organized in the future. It's communities, networks, connections first, facilitated by technology and uh, in an effective way that, that suits the organization, that suits the government, that suits the country, not the other way around. So it's my hope that, that we're not only helping St. Marta here, but even uh, become an example of this modern approach to information management for crisis situations. And I would be happy even post project to, to join St. Martha on that journey. I would look forward. I would be happy to follow that along and support it where I can. Kenny Meisters, information management expert of V and Hay International. Kenny, thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of the program and sharing this information on how St. Martin can become better and fostering resilient, um, their resiliency in a crisis um, and managing this as effectively as possible. So thank you again for being a part of the program. Thank you for having me, Cedric. And to our radio listeners, television viewers, and online viewers, thank you for tuning in and being a part of our series on fostering resilient crisis management. If you've missed this conversation with Mr. Meisters, I would like you to, of course, access video on demand at the official Facebook page of the Government of St. Martin, facebook.com forward slash sxmgov. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel of the Government of St. Martin at youtube.com at Government of St. Martin. And for audio playback, be sure to tune in to St. Martin Gov Radio 107.9 FM throughout the course of the day. On behalf of our partners at Fay and Hay International, and of course, all of us here at the Department of Communication, I want to thank you for tuning in. I'm Cedric Peterson. 